Namaskar. I'm Suresh Ratan, and I'm very happy to participate in the virtual conference of the British Geriatric Society. Uh, your president, Professor Tahir Masood, had invited me more than a year ago, and at that time, we did not know what will be happening in 2020. Although you, all of you are specialists on geriatrics, which basically means that you take care of us in old age and all our problems, uh, physical, mental. Uh, but Professor Tahir Masood thought that it will be nice if I can give you an overview of the field of aging or the biology of aging, which we call biogerontology, that what have we understood at the scientific level, why we age, you know, what happens during aging and how it happens. So it's a kind of an overview of the whole field of aging. And when we talk about aging, there are two ways of talking. The one way is, that we talk aging as a whole life story throughout one's lifespan. Yeah, that sometimes we can call that as also aging. That's why we use words like, how old is the baby? Yeah, but, but that's one way of talking. But in the biology of aging, when we talk about aging, the other is talk aging as a stage or age as a stage, for example, old age. So old age, like you geriatrics people very well know that, that when we talk about an old person, the kind of image which comes into our mind is with this kind of uh, phenotype, that there is a less and less functional ability in old age. There is more and more frailty happening and weakness is increasing. And there are increased chances of one or more diseases and which will eventually lead to death. This is what then the geriatrics is about handling that part of life and making it as better as possible. And generally it comes with all these uh, apparently negative values because it is a downhill path and all these uh, social structures that elderly people as a warning sign, etc. So the question for a biologist comes that when does aging set in? So what I have divided here, that earlier painting, which you saw a quick look, is into two parts. One part, which is going somewhere upward, that the children are growing up, reaching certain uh, maturity, and another downhill part. So we call this that aging phenotype, the way we understand aging or the old age, basically manifests itself during the period of life after essential lifespan. So this may be a new term for you, essential lifespan, because we know what is average lifespan and what is maximum lifespan. But what is essential lifespan? Essential lifespan, according to the Darwinian theory of evolution, because in biology, we try to uh, approach evolution to give us the answers to why and what are happening. So essential lifespan is the time that a species needs, like our species Homo sapiens, or another species Drosophila melanogaster, or a ratus ratus, the time needed by a species in nature, not in the protected condition, in nature, required to fulfill the purpose of life in biology, which is continuation of generations to give rise to the next generation. That time is known as essential lifespan. Like Drosophila in nature requires about seven to 10 days of essential lifespan as a species. Individuals will be dying off, but as a species, it requires seven to 10 days. But in the laboratory conditions in highly protected environment, Drosophila can live one month or two months or manipulated to live even longer. So something similar is for our species. Homo sapiens as a species, essential lifespan, well, you will think it's not a very good news, is about 45 years. Yes, evolution has selected our species in such a way or the mechanisms in such a way that we should survive to about between 40 to 50, so an average around 45 years, so that Homo sapiens as a species can continue. 
Of course, there will be some early deaths also, but that will not be very significant uh, numbers which can affect the survival of the species. So essential lifespan is a very important concept in biogerontology, that what is species lifespan? So our species lifespan is around 45. That is when old age starts. I know in modern time that sounds very paradoxical because from 45 to 60, at least there, there is a wonderful period of life. But historical or, or evolutionarily, that period is more than enough needed and nobody survived or very, very few people survived beyond that period. So aging sets in after essential lifespan. That's the first message I wanted to share with you. Aging does not start from birth. The first period is growth, development, maturation, and then after reproductive peak, then there is a downhill period of aging and old age, which is the period of survival beyond essential lifespan. And we in modern times are very fortunate people that most of us, we can expect to live much beyond essential lifespan. Evolutionary theories do give us explanations why aging is allowed to happen after essential lifespan. Uh, keep, keeping respect of the time uh, restrictions today, I will just mention these major areas that evolutionary neglect is there, that because things are happening during essential lifespan, evolution just ignores the other part, or it's a kind of a genetic dustbin or mutation accumulation is allowed to happen later in life, or antagonistic pleiotropy, that some good things are selected for early in life, but they can become old, bad in the old age, like the cholesterol metabolism or the fat accumulation, and disposable soma theory, a very powerful theory that our body's evolution has only created disposable, uh, the somatic cells in a disposable manner. They don't have to survive forever. So again, this can be a long discussion, but just to mention that these are some major uh, ways of thinking in evolutionary terms that what happens and why evolution allows aging to happen. And then there are mechanistic explanations that what is causing aging? And there again, there used to be a period when we used to call that there are uh, as many theories of mechanisms of aging as number of people working on, in the field. Uh, but one can still group them. Some people still believe in central regulators or organ specific theory like pineal gland is controlling it or immune system is controlling system specific or epigenetic regulation these days very, very popular or damage accumulation, basic metabolism and its consequences. So these are some of the ideas which I will develop further, especially the mechanisms of aging at the level of mistakes are happening, damage happening, and causing all those problems which we talk about. What is important to understand here is very, very interesting part, which has taken us 50 years to realize that evolution has not made any genes for aging. There are no gerontogenes. I coined the term gerontogenes about 30 years ago, but then spent all my life trying to prove that gerontogenes don't exist. They cannot exist. Evolution works on survival mechanisms. It has not created genes specifically for the purpose of killing me. Things go wrong. Everything in biology works through genetics. Of course, I will come to that. But there are no specific gerontogenes. Because if there are specific gerontogenes, at least theoretically, I can neutralize them or get rid of them and live forever. But there are no gerontogenes. Very, very important message to understand. Aging is not program. Program is for survival during essential lifespan. And that's where we use another term. These are the longevity assurance genes. Genes, which can be called vita genes or longevity assurance genes, which guarantee the survival of a species and the individual during essential lifespan. So when things go wrong, even in longevity assurance genes, and why they go wrong, that will be the next part. That is when we can use the term virtual gerontogenes, but they are not real gerontogenes. Yeah? There are no real gerontogenes, but there are real survival genes. So basically, that is a great understanding from biogerontology that there is no enemy within 
evolution has given me enough mechanisms and resources to survive, but it has given that much uh, survival ability for essential lifespan. And the beauty is that after essential lifespan, there are no mechanisms which are killing me either. I am allowed to survive and the body tries its best to keep on surviving, but bad things are also allowed to happen. So aging does happen in the period of survival beyond essential lifespan, but nobody is causing it. These are some important uh, uh, bits of understanding because they affect how do we deal with the situation. It's not just words that, okay, it is uh, happening or it's not causing. It is happening because there are no programs. Evolution has not created the programs. I'm re-stressing this fact again and again because that's a very important understanding, which sometimes we still miss out, even some scientists, even in the field of aging, sometimes some scientists uh, try to find out the clocks and the uh, measurement uh, mechanisms and the programs and the genes for aging. With the genes which associate with age and aging and lifespan, those are basically general metabolic genes, they are survival mechanisms. And we will come to that in a different uh, terminology next. So that terminology is the terminology of our survival ability, which is very dynamic. We often use the word homeostasis, which means same state. And that's another mistake a lot of scientists still keep on making. There is no homeostatic situations in living systems. Living systems are very dynamic, interactive, and they're so complex. And at the metabolic level, there are hundreds of thousands of metabolome units which interact with each other. It's not a machine. Yeah? So that homeostasis is an outdated uh, term in my understanding. But then in mid 90s, Yates in uh, England introduced the term homeodynamics, that it's actually a very dynamic state and the same, but dynamics. I call it also homeodynamic space. A child is born with certain homeodynamic state, space, this green uh, region. It has a large red region where things can go wrong in early childhood especially, but during growth, development, maturation, that early part of the survival, that is where homeodynamic space matures and reaches a peak by the time we reach reproductive age. And that is the, our survival ability, homeodynamic space. The three main characteristics of homeodynamic space are stress response, that we are able to tolerate any disturbance from outside or inside and counteract that through a very complex series of stress responses where hundreds of genes are involved. And then, constant uh, this uh, damage control because damage is all the time happening, but there are so many mechanisms to counteract the damage, to remove the damage, to repair the damage and constant remodeling, especially in the immune system. These are the central themes of homeodynamic space. If we have this homeodynamic space, which has certain vulnerability zone, things can go wrong at any age, but earlier before in the essential lifespan, very few things go wrong unless you have some other problems. So that is what gives us a survival ability. And when we talk about aging, then comes the third part. Aging is the progressive shrinkage of the homeodynamic space our ability to tolerate stress, our ability to remove and repair damage, our ability to adapt and remodel becomes lesser and lesser during the period of survival beyond essential lifespan. Okay. We'll come to that, why that happens. But this is one way of visualizing uh, aging or old age. It's a shrinkage of the homeodynamic space. Day-to-day -day life in old age can be fine, but one challenge, one strong challenge, who gets killed in COVID uh, times now? What do you see that? That our ability to adapt, remodel and stress response is reduced. So the likelihood of problems and death of the elderly are observed to be very high. 
even with COVID. So that is also the explanation for the origin of all these major diseases of old age, which you geriatricians deal with, whether it's Parkinson's disease, whether it's Alzheimer or osteoporosis or diabetes too, or cataract, all major diseases of modern life in which most of the infectious diseases have been controlled, except for this 2020's new challenge, they are due to this shrinkage of the homeodynamic space. Aging is the cause of all those diseases. So as biomedical people, most common approach uh, uh, is the utilization of the treatment or therapeutic approach is take one disease at a time. But at, as a biogerontologist, we want to argue for understanding and finding means of affecting this aging process, which leads to this increased probabilities. No disease happens to everybody. That is basically, again, a definition of uh, diseases. Yes, uh, maybe 15, 20% of very old people will get Alzheimer, but about 80% or 85% will not get Alzheimer, but they will be old. Same applies to any other disease. So every age-related disease has the aging process as its common background. And that's very, very important to understand. We can, is, even as doctors, we use that of the term, oh, this is you do, do the old age factor. But why? Why old age factor is so important? That is the reason. Because our homeodynamic space, which is great until about 45 years, according to our species essential lifespan, is shrinking progressively. And the reason for shrinking is then described in this 50 years of research, what happens when we are in the process of aging or when we are becoming old. And that's an amazing achievement of biogerontology. So aging phenotype has been described at the individual level, group level, population level, then within the individual systems, organs, tissues, and then going down the bottom part of the slide is all that metabolic pathways. I have just highlighted a few main ones that what happens like a telomere loss or there are glycations or uh, mTOR. Uh, is there are so many variables and I can just fill up the whole slide with examples on and on and on. We almost completely understand what happens during aging. It's so beautifully uh, they were listed that this organ, this cell, this thing uh, is changing with age, fulfilling the definition that it's progressively becoming less functional, more frail, more chances of problems. So why it happens? Again, I have talked in the evolutionary part, imperfect maintenance and repair systems. Evolution does not work on perfection. Evolution works on what works for essential lifespan. There is no example in evolution where things are perfected. If things were perfect, there will be no evolution actually. So DNA damage, RNA damage, protein damage, other macromolecular damages, those are the reasons which cause this shrinkage. Those damages are occurring from day one, but they are less important for the survival of the body at a species level. Individually, it might give a problem to some. This is the reason why homeodynamic space decreases. But very important part here, this process of aging, when damage accumulation happens or whatever other parameter you use, what is happening during aging, is very heterogeneous and individualistic. No two people become old exactly in the same way, not even monozygotic twins. They may be a bit more similar, but not they are same. No two well, men and women become old differently. Individuals age differently. Different parts of the body age at different rates according to the history of life of that individual. Yeah, my muscles might be weaker than my liver depending upon what kind of diseases I got in ch early childhood or even before childhood. Even prenatal situations affect your lifespan throughout. Then different cell types age differently. Within the same tissue, eight cells are uh, aging in such a heterogeneous way that even within the cell, there is a molecular heterogeneity. This is a very, very important observation, which basically means there is no one single, either a cause or a target for intervention. 
those guys who would like you to believe that we will have magic pills, either at this uh, kind of epigenetic marker or a genetic marker or a protein marker, and that will apply to all the organs of the body and all the people there. No, uh, they are either ignorant or they are deliberately choosing uh, to say that, which is not scientifically correct. And they are not ignorant generally. They know that this heterogeneity and the individualistic nature of aging and age-related decline is very, very factual uh, observation. So when we want to do think anything about aging, we will have to consider this part also. Another way of saying, uh, in the geriatrics, you guys know very well that the air data scatter increases with age. There are uh, data for muscle mass, cognitive response, older the human being or the population a group, wider the uh, scatter. In young age, we are much more similar to each other, but we become different more and more and more. This data scatter, this is a very well-established geriatric uh, observation. And a philosophic way of saying it, one Danish philosopher once uh, we are born as a copy, but we die as an original. I like this statement, that's why I always use it, that evolutionary process has certain restrictions. There are not many ways of being born, but more we live, more original we become. So becoming old or our life story is actually a story of how do we become original. And eventually, yes, we will die. That's fine enough. But aging cannot be grouped as a one monolithic situation or one causative uh, situation where we can just simply interfere. So again, to remind you, Aging is the shrinkage of the homeodynamic space. Then come, what can we do about age and aging or in old age? You know, these are the kind of uh, uh, very famous German uh, painting from the 16th century. The people are looking for fountains of youth where you come from one side and you become young. And that you can notice in this famous painting that it's only the women who go into the fountain of youth. There is no single man getting this uh, rejuvenation uh, treatment. But what do we really want to do in old age? Yes, as geriatrician, you guys are doing fantastic job in helping me live healthy old age. If I have any problem, you will give me some drugs and other things. But if we want to deal with the total process of aging, and what do we want to do? And that question. Also, we need to discuss among ourselves in society. Do we want to become young again? Is that the aim? Because then we should do that kind of studies. Or do we want to become old, but slowly? Is that what we want as human beings? Or become old, but stay healthy? You know, these are our approaches because that will lead to what kind of interventions can come. Or the ultimate reason why we are so afraid of old age, because Old age leads to death. I know I'm going to die. So I'm terrified. I'm afraid. So maybe becoming immortal might be the ultimate uh, scientific intervention. What I cannot say is when I will die at an individual level. I also know that all of you will be dying. Sooner or later, you will be dying. All the people you love, they will also die. Very depressing. The only compensation is all the people you hate, they will also die. So death is a reality. So should we go for the immortality? Maybe we need to think about it. But how do we go about it? That's a difficult. And what is happening right now, that's where I will give you just an overview. The major approach or a common approach is with the viewpoint of aging as a machine. Yeah, because all those things I have shown in the previous picture that they relate with aging, then the uh, approach is that if we take that target, if we elongate telomere, if we can put back methylation correctly, or if we can uh, uh, work on one target, mTOR or a proteasome, that will recover aging. Well, that's a very, very, very narrow reductionistic approach. It is very good for acute situations which can help. But if we want to deal with that aging as a shrinkage of the homeodynamic space, this is not going to work. There is naive extrapolations from model system to human and naive extrapolations from one target to the whole body and then overhyped claims. 
And that often ends up in causing depression and dissatisfaction. And then people become anti-scientists, basically. That, oh, come on, they just keep on claiming these and these things. But a lot of uh, my colleagues uh, in our field keep uh, pushing that kind of agenda, taking one target at a time and claiming the miracle. Well, there are lots of sociological, economic, psychological, reasons around that. But as a biogerontologist, I'm giving you the overview that that approach has certain limited value, but not a total uh, healthy old age kind of value. So piecemeal remedies, which is the strongest power that what goes wrong, you use it. That's again the machine metaphor, but our bodies are not mach machines. These are very powerful tools. Yeah, you, we replace organs, we give stem cells. Now it's uh, synolytics, so removing senescent cells if we know where they are and how many to remove. Or all these things about replenishment. Those are also basically based on single target. If this vitamin goes down, you take it. If this hormone goes down, you take it. None of these things work. Or take some general vague things like antioxidants. Or the technology is coming to make our old age uh, say better or healthier. The, the challenge is how to affect this rate of aging by maintaining homeodynamics or keeping homeodynamic space or reducing its rate of shrinkage. Can we do that? So basically, <coughs> what we need, there are more holistic approaches. And one of the main Holistic approaches these days, which is becoming very popular, is the philosophy of hormesis. Hormesis is a relationship between stress and health. We all know that stress, chronic and high level stress is very, very damaging. Yeah? We are all stressed about it, actually. But stress is also the principle of life. The stress at a lower level is actually health promoting low level stress, which we sometimes also call stress of choice is very, very beneficial. And you all know, we all do that after a very stressful day. What I do in the evening, I pack up my bag and I go to a place where I pay the money and get more stress. What is that? Physical exercise. Physical exercise is a stress which causes beneficial effects by because repeated stress of choice is good for health. And why it is good for health? We will talk more on the mechanisms of hormesis uh, uh, in a separate lecture tomorrow. Uh, but today, the concept I want to introduce is hormesis is the biphasic dose response. Uh, there are no th uh, linear curves anymore in toxicology or radiation biology. Everything almost study which becomes toxic at certain level is actually health promoting by challenging the system and the system has its survival mechanisms. Yeah? All those are uh, sort of stress responses and remodeling. So this, there are various terms used for that, U-shaped curve, inverted U-shape, J-shape, but now we call it, the common word is hormetic curve. And the phenomenon is hormesis, that low level stress challenges your own survival mechanisms and you gain benefits out of it. The conditions which cause hormesis are called hormetins. Just the word like hormetin is a condition which is potentially hormetic. Like physical exercise is a hormetin. Radiations are hormetins. Psychological, mental exercises, nutritional hormetin, a lot of things in the food we eat are good because they actually cause stress. We will take this, uh, all examples and this mechanisms more tomorrow in the different lecture. So today I would like to just introduce this concept that hormesis is a very powerful interventional uh, strategy. It's a holistic strategy. Holistic, I like to use with the W-H-O-L-E, whole from the, not, not the hocus pocus holistic, but scientific holism. Which means, like when I do exercise, when, I, when I'm walking, brisk walking or muscular exercise of the legs, it gives me whole body benefits. My mood improves, my cognition improves, my immune system improves, my circulation improves. I feel good up in every aspect. It's not just the muscles which get that. And why they get that all the benefits? Because you have introduced a little bit of stress. And then body does something 
which gives you certain beneficial effects. And that's also the thing we will explain a bit more the mechanisms of that. So hormetins for hormesis is at the moment a very, very promising aging interventional strategy. And a lot of data are also being reinterpreted from hormesis. And these are, I'm just showing three books where I have been a part of uh, compiling the book. And these things can help us to maintain health in terms of maintaining homeodynamic space. Now here, the aim of biogerontology is to maintain health, recover health, and enhance health. And the, as geriatrics, you guys really help people when they have acute situations, but how to maintain it and even enhance it? And that's where the question comes. We all want to talk about health. We want to maintain it. We want to improve it. We want to recover it. The problem is we know very little about what is health. And that book, which I showed in the previous slide, that's uh, one of my recent books, which has come explaining health philosophers, uh, psychologists, demographers, evolutionary biologists, uh, uh, medical practitioners, they're all talking about what do we mean by a healthy heart or a healthy face or a healthy mind or a healthy brain, not using disease as an example. And that is what the definition of health by WHO standard is. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. This is the official definition, but it's not very useful because it uses uh, the word well-being, replaces health with well-being, but we don't know what is well-being. So another way of defining health in which several of uh, biogerontologists and other scientists and myself, we have been involved, is defining health in certain practical manner. So one definition of health is idealistic definition, absolute physical and mental independence in activities of daily living. Yeah? Activities of daily living, genetics and other people, we are all absolutely clear about what are those. There are 50, 60 activities. Of, the, the definition is absolute physical and mental independence, but this is a useless definition, just like a WHO, because nobody has it. Nobody will ever have absolute health in terms of absolute physical and mental independence. So let's forget about that part. What is then the real definition of health? That is adequate physical and mental independence in activities of daily living. And this is where sociology, psychology, personal temperament comes in. What is adequate at what stage in life? Yeah? We, you cannot push me at the age of 65 that I should behave and uh, even function like a 16 years old. What is adequate for me at this age? might need also lots of medicine. Adequate means use technology, use medicine, use doctor's help <coughs> to get adequate physical and mental independence. If in future I am lying on a bed and waiting somebody to come or ad adequate health at that age will be what? Adequate health will be, I can get up from my bed and reach the toilet in time. That might be adequate. So adequate is basically sociological, philosophical, psychological kind of issue. We need to learn. Huh? Doctors do advise me. Oh, this is now the age part. One should learn to adjust. Adequate uh, definition of health actually requires the use of all the technology. I do take metformin to control my diabetes too. And if I need to use some other medicines for keeping my adequate independence, I will use them. If I need to use technology to walk, yes, there is nothing to be ashamed of. I started using these glasses 40 years ago yeah, so that I have adequate my vision. So this is the practical definition of health, which uh, uh, many scientists we would like to now promote. That health is adequate physical and mental independence in activities of daily living. And that is what we need to learn. <coughs> How do we apply all our knowledge from basic science, which for human beings, the science from sociology, from psychology, from population studies, how do we help each other or as doctors, our patients, to keep certain level of physical and mental independence to have healthy aging, 
Sometimes people now call it healthy longevity or successful aging, but healthy old age. And, but that raises also certain questions for us to ponder. <coughs> As I already mentioned that yes, biogerontology says that instead of anti-aging, anti-aging will mean that whatever has happened now we either want to revert it thoroughly we should concentrate on maintaining health throughout life, but especially in the period when aging happens, which is the period beyond essential lifespan. And doctor must give me the medicine by saying, hey, Suresh, take this medicine. It will give you health. You will feel healthy. Instead of labeling all the time a disease, now you have got um, diabetes, now you are having early signs of Alzheimer, now you are having this cataract, that frightens. But technology, medicine should help me to feel that I should be healthy, I can recover health. But the question comes for how long? How long I want to stay healthy and why? Now that is a, not a biological question, that's basically a sociological question how long we want to live. Average lifespan in the world has been increasing, but the differences are still gigantic. There are many countries where average lifespan is still around essential lifespan, yeah, between 45 and 50. But in most of the economically developed countries, the average lifespan is double than that. But we want to live longer than that. Some people go beyond 100. One person has lived 122 years. How long I want to live? I need to find out. Find out both with the hope of technology, but also the reasons, what for? How long we want to live and what is our concept of health? Biogerontology, the study of the biological basis of aging have helped me raise these questions, understand the issues and even find certain answers for myself. That is the message I would like to share with you, but Hormesis part, I will try to talk tomorrow more. So I'm very happy for this opportunity, which uh, the president of uh, British Geriatric Society gave me, Dr. Tahir Masood. And I hope that I have been able to share the central message of biogerontology, understanding aging for having healthy old age and for as long as you want, okay? Thank you very much. Namaskar.